another lecture reading. My name is Melinda Cole Klein. During the late medieval period, reading and book publishing led to commercializing knowledge. With the invention of the printing press, theories and concepts became more accessible to those interested in politics, economic practices, religious ideas, and social thought. This resulted in debates among Europe's thinking men, from the lowly apprentice to monks and politicians. Because of the support of printing efforts, European books were in high demand to include religious commentaries and geographical accounts such as those that in time would be published documenting the new world for a hungry literary population. The printing press, the publications, and the support to publish by those believing in their words and philosophies altered the course of knowledge from within the cloistered environment of the Catholic Church to a broader access of knowledge available to the nobility to the common man as a commercially produced set of writings. In this time, two events would shape history and the course of Western civilization. First would be the reform efforts by Martin Luther between the 1510s and into the 1520s. This would split Christianity in Europe into two branches. Thus, three forms of Christianity were that of Protestants, Greek Orthodox, and Catholic believers. In the next decade, King Henry VIII set into motion, with the approval of Parliament, a set of laws that would have profound effects on the nation's politics, religious and judicial structure, along with tax collecting and revenue. Prior to this English Reformation, the Catholic Church possessed about 30% of the nation's property. And before Henry VIII assumed power, the Church in England paid little in the way of tax, while the pattern was far from incomplete from the 1530s. British citizens would begin the long journey that would follow in the way of Martin Luther that required a permanent break with Rome. Martin's attempt to reform the Church of Rome had unforeseen consequences as it split the Catholic Church, led to the death of thousands. This is from the elite to the peasantry. Nonetheless, the people who protested against the corrupt practices of the Catholic Church formed a new Christian faith. These believers called themselves Protestants, those who protested against the Church of Rome. This social revolution fundamentally affected Europeans at the most basic level. How they should believe in God, how they should practice this religion, by whom will it be taught? And once Martin Luther had made available his Bible for publication, rulers to peasants could read or have read to them the Word of God. Common practice for Catholics was to have close ties to their priests, as it was from these men the Word of God could be heard. Thus, only Catholic priests' salvation could be had along with admonishment from their sins. With a new religious faith established by Martin Luther and others that would follow, being a European Christian now had options. For Protestants, no earthly man could forgive your sins. Only God had this power. For Protestants reading the Bible, religion became more personal creating ties between the believer and the divine. 
Protestant religious leaders were the teachers, the keepers of the faith, and those who performed rituals. Thus, this new religious cleric could live like a man, not as God's representative on earth. While Protestant ministers would marry, a principle Martin Luther encouraged, his translated version of the Bible would become generally available, as it was printed in languages spoken by the people. And from this tradition, prayer books and other religious texts would follow. Uh, the name of this lecture, my title, is uh, The Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther and Henry VIII. I've included a few historical categories that are going to be covered in this reading today. Uh, first, uh, of course, is uh, Martin Luther. Writings, uh, reform efforts, and the rejection of the selling of indulgences. Followed by three features set into motion, the Protestant Reformation. The European press and the spread of ideas including technology, trade and publications, print shop commerce, and new economic value in secondhand textiles. And then the second half of this reading is going to consider the following. The English Reformation under King Henry VIII and the Dissolution of the Monasteries, 15. 31 to 1540, legal, economic, and social changes to daily life. Church and state in England, 1547 to 1558, reforms under the government of King Edward VI, the persecution of Protestants under Queen Mary, and a new order begins under Queen Elizabeth I. In the 1510s, receiving his law degree, Martin Luther pursued a degree in theology with the PhD. This allowed Martin to become a German monk and professor. During his graduate experience, he found his calling as a reformer. Martin became passionate about speaking out against what he saw as corruptions not only practices, but a direction from which his superiors desired Christianity to be taught and practiced. For Dr. Luther, he saw error in their interpretations of Scripture. Additionally, this young priest saw his parishioners tormented instead of religion being a source of hope. In time, his philosophies and teachings inspired the Protestant Reformation, which altered the course of European life. Luther saw the system of indulgences as a form of corruption that was politically motivated. The selling of indulgences, a piece of paper signed by a priest, promised the loved one paying the money that their dead relative or someone not yet deceased would be able to shorten their time in purgatory. Medieval Catholic priests encouraged believers to purchase an indulgence. Monies collected were arguably used, for example, to create a chapel or a cathedral, for that matter. One of the priests Martin targeted in particular was that of John Tetzel. As a seller of indulgences, Martin quoted, this selling point by Tetzel that's come down to us in history. In his masses, Tetzel commonly offered this catchphrase to Catholic parishioners. As soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. This implies that once believers put their coins into the metal collection box, their loved one rises to heaven. This fearful and theatrical demonstration that targeted the poor and others would drive Dr. Luther to write 
in which he condemned the selling of indulgences. In 1517, he wrote to his bishop, this effort would not see the matter closed. At this meeting, directly correcting Martin, this was attempted, but it was not quite what Martin, of course, had on his mind in regards to this religious matter. Additionally, Dr. Martin argued that the Pope, instead of using collected monies for matters of state or building projects, why was he not using the money instead to help the poor? This raised Luther to the attention of other high-ranking officials. All the while, the Catholic Church needed to raise money to help support military efforts. After the fall of Constantinople in 1453 to Muslims of the Ottoman Empire, this is going to bring attention more so to this empire that is pushing northward with aims of conquering Europe to fight such efforts and to support the wealth of the higher ranks of the Catholic Church, this effort required ready cash. While Martin Luther had no intention originally to separate from the Catholic Church, only to reform what he saw as its corrupting influences and practices, three features set into motion the Protestant Reformation. Number one, Luther preached three sermons against indulgences in 1516 and also in 1517. His lectures targeted the Church of Rome as abusing its own people. Because of their fear of purgatory, perhaps millions of Christians bought indulgences over the decades, in which this practice was applied. Luther believed indulgence selling to be wrong, as it did not reflect the true spirit and meaning of Christian rituals. In efforts to state his reforms clearly, Luther wrote the 95 Theses disputing the practice of indulgences and other issues by January 1518. It was printed in German. This list of condemnations included the greed and material worth from which the Catholic Church hierarchy enjoyed, in particular naming individual priests and their deeds. All right, moving on to number two. Eventually, Luther was brought up on charges of heresy. While he had made some concession in 1519, in the summer of 1520, Luther received a papal bull. This is a religious mandate. To retract sections from his 95 theses in 60 days or less, Luther burned this edict by the end of the year. And in a public debate over the validity of Martin's writings, Martin had scriptural evidence that did not limit access to the Bible only to priests. For the attending crowd, it was obvious Martin was on their side. The church needed to silence him. The continuation and unity of the Holy Roman Empire depended on religious unity. However, Dr. Luther made sense and was genuinely loved. He had some noble support and that of his teacher. In his trial that was held in Augsburg, Germany, from January until May, his writings were on display. The evaluating panel consisted of the Diet of Worms headed by the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. This panel debated Luther's writings while he had an opportunity to reply. In the final day of the proceedings in which he was required to respond to the charges of heresy, Luther stated, and I quote, 
unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason. For I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. May God help me. Amen. And this is the end of the quoted passage. While the Diet of Worms would continue to conclude and deliberate among themselves, Luther did not recant. Now in hiding, he was considered an outlaw and needed to be found so justice could be served. All right, so let's move on to point number three. While Martin Luther was protected in hiding by Frederick III of Saxony, his 95 theses would burn in public bonfires where Catholic authorities ordered such heresies destroyed. To excuse the expression, such public demonstrations set afire under thousands of Martin followers. In turn, they used violence. They vandalized cathedrals and destroyed private property in efforts to undermine church authority in northern Germany. A man of peace and words, Martin did not condone this behavior. In time, the rioting eased. While Martin Luther was protected while in hiding by Frederick III of Saxony, his 95 theses would burn in public bonfires where Catholic authorities ordered such heresies destroyed. Such public demonstrations inspired thousands of Martin followers to use violence themselves. They vandalized cathedrals and destroyed private property in efforts to undermine church authority in northern Germany. A man of peace and words, Martin did not condone this behavior. In time, the rioting eased. But for Martin Luther, on the run after his trial, he did not take back his words or agree to renounce his beliefs, writings, and teachings. Martin was convinced the church required reforms. So he left the priesthood. This allowed Martin to develop a new Christian faith. And those who followed his teachings closely became known as Lutherans. In time, he married a former nun, Katharina von Bora, which reintroduced the practice of marriage by and to religious leaders, both men and women. In their private life, Martin and his wife would become parents. Martin would be a good gardener and continue to preach, though he made little money for his family. Nonetheless, Katerina provided for the family through her efforts when needed. Thus, this marriage proved to be a partnership. Martin would continue to steer the direction of Protestantism through his writings. In time, his ideas would reach the ears of King Henry VIII in London. Another important Reformation leader was that of John Calvin, a French priest who had become Protestant. He was only eight years old when Martin Luther wrote his 95 Theses. Calvin advocated to his followers that reading the Bible was the ultimate word of God. This tradition inspired new sects of Protestants, such as the Puritans, who adopted Calvin's teachings such as predestination. 
Like Martin Luther, those who followed the teachings and principles of John Calvin were, and are still, called Calvinists. One feature of Calvin's biblical interpretation would inspire a community of believers and leave its mark among these Protestants from this time to modern times. This philosophy by John Calvin was called predestination. According to this doctrine, before the birth of a child, his or her salvation had already been decided by God. In turn, this Christian attempted to discover if he or she was one of the chosen ones, one that would go ultimately to heaven. This created traditions and practices that required dedicated personal ties to religious piety and practices over a lifetime with an ardent evaluation of different events. This would lead to the creation of congregations to which a parishioner's deed and behavior came under scrutiny. The Renaissance witnessed the development of printing, which made the immediate impact on European intellectual life and thought. While printing from hand-carved wooden blocks had been used in China since the 1100s, what was new in regards to this period and this moment was movable type. This innovation was done over time. It was perfected between 1445 and 1450 by Johann Gutenberg of Mainz, Germany. The first book he published was the Christian Bible. And for decades since, the most popular publications among readers was religious literature. Learned men, priests, medical doctors, and men of the law spoke and wrote a common language. This was Latin. But this was not the language of the people or the average noble unless a university education had been completed. Therefore, books such as the Bible could not be commonly understood. Martin Luther's Bible influenced the printing of French and German Bibles and later the English King James Bible in 1616. The spread of printed materials during the late medieval period in Europe undermined the power and authority of the Catholic Church. This allowed for human knowledge to develop apart from religious study. In Protestant countries, such as in England and the Dutch provinces, scientists and medical men offering new theories or ideas were not sanctioned as heretics, but published freely. As the field of science progressed, its arguments were based on research, observation, and the collection of data. The first printed European book, was done sometime between 1455 and 1456, used with movable type. But before he could print a single letter, there were other innovations that would make this process possible. Number one, first, Gutenberg needed a press. The adaptation for the printing press was done using a wine or olive oil screw type press that had been used for hundreds of years throughout Europe and Asia. Next, it was the adaptation of block print technology. Following this would be the development of mass production paper making techniques. Rice paper was brought from China to Italy in the 1100s but it was thought too flimsy for books. Prior to the printing press, European books were made of vellum out of calf or lamb skin. They were very durable and they have survived in museums today. In Gutenberg's time, paper began to be processed in mills. And this 
production actually has five elements that I would like you to remember. Number one, production of paper made primarily out of old woolen or linen clothes and textiles would begin in a boiling pot. By creating a mash of wood pulp and old cloth fibers, this would form in time a pulpy liquid. A craftsman then dips a rectangular mold into the liquid and shakes it, fusing the fibers together to form a sheet of paper. The sheet is then placed on a piece of felt and layered with other sheets until dry. This paper making process produced a durable paper product. Number five, supply and availability of paper to print on enabled the production of books. In doing so, it created a commercial enterprise by what are remembered in history as the Ragman. Such buyers of old clothing and textiles would sell them to print shops, greatly needed in paper production. This commerce in second-hand clothing continued well into the modern period. Smaller rural cities in Britain still had ragmen into the 1950s because linen cloth was traditionally worn and used in draperies. When Henry VIII became king in 1509, the court celebrated with dancing and rejoicing. Henry was not the first choice for king, or for that matter, the firstborn. He became king because his brother Arthur had died in 1502. After the death of his brother Arthur, Henry was formally betrothed to Catherine in 1503 when he was only 11 years old. When he was 14, young Henry demanded release from this arrangement in which he was to marry his brother's widow. Spain was no longer considered as much of a threat to England by this time. In the eyes of young Henry, such a marriage no longer served national concerns of the English state. When his father died in 1509, Henry received the right to rule. Once king, Henry agreed he would marry Catherine as it had been his father's dying wish. Perhaps. To ensure her daughter's rightful place, Queen Isabel would enlist the confidence of the Pope. Combine pressures to do the right thing, the dowry money paid by the Spanish crown to the English state could not be returned as these funds had been misappropriated. Such factors likely influenced his decision and weighed heavy on his mind. After much reluctance and hesitation, Henry was barely 18 years of age when he did do the right thing and married his brother's widow. According to scholars, the maturing king maintained a rather vindictive side to his personality, especially towards some individuals that he did not like. At times, this king would assert his personality and had the power to be threatening. And if threatened, the king was a man of his words. Justifiably, people feared his temper. Henry differed from his father in several respects. While Henry stood out in his lavish and expensive outfits, his father was frugal in dress, manner, and in his form of entertainments and also in regards to the company that he kept. Henry's academic studies were limited, and he was not allowed, while his father was alive, to have any official capacity. When he did appear at official events, Henry was kept under strict supervision. 
As a result, young Henry ascended the throne without any formal experience. However, by the time he became king, Henry was grounded in theology. Henry knew much about what he wanted in a Christian religion and understood its connections to political authority and how it could support economic growth. Additionally, he was a quick learner in other respects regarding rulership, his authority, and the power of government. As Henry and his government worked towards common goals, he instituted certain imperial practices. This included the desire to go to war in efforts to extend one's national boundaries. With fully formed ideas regarding state building, by 1535, Henry VIII would be king of Ireland and annex Wales to England. However, England was not, in the 1500s, comparable in any regard to, say, the giants of Spain. Monies were needed to rectify this situation, and King Henry would in time spend large sums to build a navy and a military English presence. Roles and practices of the Catholic Church in England before the Protestant Reformation of the 1530s. In Henry's 16th century England, the Catholic Church had social, judicial, and economic ties to the people who lived in each parish town across England, Ireland, and Wales. Two features in particular stand out. Number one, the church was responsible for ministering to the masses, teaching Christian morality. When God's laws were deemed broken, the church courts moved into action to administer justice and to ensure order would be maintained under English common law. When church laws were broken, typically factors tied to marriage and family, ecclesiastical courts heard the issues. They decided on the proper course of action and applied the necessary judgments or penalties. With such legal actions, order was restored to the family and its community. Sentences were light, such as to pay a fine, uh, an act of penance, or fasting to be observed or witnessed over a period of time. Ecclesiastical courts gave swift justice. With minor corrections, church officials mandated marriage obeyed the laws, and maintained one's household by working. These were required. All right, for point number two, during Henry's reign, this Tudor government would begin to tax monks who inhabited church property more so than in the past. Monasteries and the clerics who lived on the large landed estates were self-supportive and created surplus goods resulting in monetary gain. The church owned about 30% of all the land in England. They raised their own crops, created freshwater canals, made their own beer and wine, shipped their surplus goods to market, of course creating profits, and became centers of handwritten book republication. Uh, these would be the scriptoriums. Monks and clerics sheared sheep, produced wool to spin into cloth, to wear and sell. By the 1400s, the Catholic Church was very wealthy from this economic system practiced across Europe. Oftentimes, regional monarchs looked the other way because of the complex roles the Catholic Church served in rural and urban communities. All the while, monastery prophets were sent out of the country to Rome. As commerce and long-distance trade uh, with the Americas created serious wealth, 
Henry VIII needed to fund his military and maritime efforts and with features of national defense in mind. Henry's Tudor government understood existing on a tiny island, land was at a premium, and monasteries wielded power and authority while turning a profit. Monasteries were obligated to send monies out of the country back to Rome a common and accepted practice across Europe. As the Protestant Reformation gained attention by European rulers, this system of exporting monies to Rome was condemned. The printing press allowed the circulation of new ideas, political, religious, literary, and scientific. Medieval Renaissance scholars revived Greek ideas and philosophies of man's capacity for rational thought. While the printing press used in cities across Europe, such doctrines could be read more easily than in previous centuries and by a wider economic spectrum of society. From literate craftsmen and merchants who would become the up-and-coming middle class to elites and the nobility. Renaissance ideas argued, among other things, that man had more control over his destiny than mandated by the Church of Rome, a concept Protestants hold dear today. This line of reasoning suggested that perhaps the world in which man lived also belonged to him. Could a man rule his own destiny in this world, or were all of his actions irrelevant because God had already decided his destiny for heaven or hell? Scholars of humanism advocated that man and his ability to think rationally for himself could be trusted. This rational thinking man would act in the best interest of others, for his family and as a responsible citizen of his state. Such circulating ideas created intellectual and political debates across Europe. This idea was radical and contradicted the Catholic view that man only behaved or lived a life of honor and respect through fear of damnation. Instead, Protestantism promoted self-regulation, responsibility for one's actions, and self-reflection before and after acts and deeds. In time, these lines of argument and impact of Martin Luther's writings made their way to London, to Cambridge University, and to the king's household itself through Anne Boleyn. Through these writing publications, Henry learned of the popularity that was growing across Europe. At the top of his list was to distrust Rome and the Catholic Church in regards to rulership and economic growth. From these writings of Luther, European rulers were listening. During this religious revolution sat Henry in England without a legal heir. Six points weighed heavy on his mind. Number one, Luther's writings consistently profess to distrust Rome and its popes. Martin had published in 1521 De Votis Monastetis on the monastic vows. This doctrine argued that monks and their works with communities had no scriptural basis, meaning that the states did not have any reason to support them. In essence, their religious roles and presence was pointless. Number two, while his brother's wife had borne him five children, only Princess Mary survived childhood. Henry 
wanted a son, a true heir to the English throne. Under Salic law, only a male could carry on the family name. He did have an illegitimate son, this would be Fitzroy, who would die in 1536. By 1527, Catherine was older and out of childbearing age. All right, moving on to point number three. The current Pope had denied Henry the annulment from Catherine that he had requested. In short order, Henry declared himself, not the Pope, the supreme head of the Church of England. All right, point number four. His country was in desperate need of national funds. Before the English government made this move, the King of Sweden created legislation in which monasteries were confiscated. This was done as believed necessary to increase the national treasury. Thus, formerly donated lands by the Swedes to the church were voided and the land was taken by the state. A path England would begin in 1531. All right, point number five. Henry desired the young and sweet Anne Boleyn. Lastly, number six, Henry desired for the state to be strong, and this meant ending the practice by monasteries to expatriate funds earned on English soil. This set into motion the desires to end Catholicism in England and follow the movement begun by Martin Luther, thus taking control of his state. It took time and the creation of new laws to transform the national religion in Britain. By 1531, King Henry was declared by English law the supreme head of the Church of England. This set into motion legislation that would follow resulting in the dissolution of the monasteries. And this was accomplished by 1541. About 5,000 monks and nuns lived and worked in England at the beginning of the dissolution. This number quickly dropped. At first, these clerics were asked voluntarily to vacate their religious houses. In time, this state mandate was compulsory. Monks who resisted were arrested. Several died in jail. Others were executed. However, the state allowed handicapped and ailing clerics to remain. They acquired small pensions and were relieved of their duties. There were 650 monasteries across England, not counting hundreds more in Wales and Ireland. Their value was assessed in a study, uh, typically what we would call an ecclesiastical census, I suppose. This was accomplished in about six months, or by 1535. It revealed the vastly inadequate ways in which the monasteries were operating at the time. The monasteries for centuries had operated outside of the view of state authority. In 1536, the king ordered that monasteries that had not produced incomes over 200 pounds annually to be demolished. This number tallied to 419 religious houses in England. This was by far the majority. By 1538, the king ordered that religious property and material worth to be auctioned or leased out. By 1539, the earlier law that encouraged voluntary surrender was amended. In refusing to leave England as ordered by the king, these religious leaders committed treason against the state. Three abbots resisted. They were hanged, drawn, and quartered. By 1540, the dissolution of the monasteries was complete 
as the last two abbeys were dissolved. In the end, over 100 monasteries continued as Church of England parishes and 14 became Anglican cathedrals, such as Westminster in London. Other monastic houses, large and small, were reduced to ruins. All the while, local populations continued to loot and destroy this property. Across England, Ireland, and Wales, local authority had purchased the remaining former monasteries to which they would be able to continue until the present day as features of Protestant houses of worship. For 419 abbeys less fortunate, towns after the dissolution saw the sale of their valuables that remained. Stones, roof tiles, and lead plumbing became available for construction materials across the realm. Dissolution legislation set into motion the wholesale destruction of most of the monastic houses. Religious relics were stolen. Religious valuables taken. Buildings set on fire. Some monastic houses survived the destruction and are national treasures and historic places today. This king would get his divorce and eventually six wives. Henry would get his son, Edward VI, born to him by his third wife, Jane Seymour. For the surviving daughters in Reformed England, Henry's divorce to Catherine of Aragon and subsequent remarriages declared his children by former wives, living or dead, as illegitimate because the marriages were not recognized by the Anglican Church. This left the princesses, both Mary and Elizabeth, with no legal or political standing. Young Edward, as a child, was never strong. His fragile state of health was recognized early in life. The legal issue at hand was the question of succession. Who would rule England after Henry's death if Edward died and produced no male heir of his own? After much political deliberating, Henry's daughters, princesses Mary and Elizabeth, would rule after Edward in case anything happened to him. In 1544, English law put the daughters back into the line of succession if the worst happened and Edward died without producing an heir. Thus, the pattern of succession following the death of King Henry VIII took this particular course in history. Number one, Henry VIII died in January 1547. This monarch had been in poor health, aggravated by obesity. He was only 55 years of age. Point two, the king's young son, Edward VI became England's rightful heir in 1547 at the age of nine, but died six years later at 15 years old. So this would be the year 1553. And this is the same age as his uncle Arthur died in 1502. After the death of her stepbrother Edward in 1553, Princess Mary became queen and ruled for five years until her death in 1558, remembered as Bloody Mary, because of her brutal treatment of Puritans espousing reform to her father's church and also Protestants in general. All right, point number four. From 1558, Princess Elizabeth assumed the throne, never married, and ruled until her death in 1603. 
However, without a Tudor heir, the family dynasty came to an end. The right to rule passed to Scotland, the Stuarts, from which this family branch ruled until 1714. Once young King Edward inherited his right to rule, his reign was punctuated with a war with Scotland, social division, and economic woes. While his father had created a break with Rome, Catholic ceremony and rituals continued. Under the government of King Edward VI, the religious structure of the Anglican Church began to take shape as a Protestant system of worship. Following doctrines of Martin Luther, King Edward ended the ban on marriage by clerics. Additionally, his reforms included compulsory church attendance and the printing of the common book of prayer. However, these reforms after his death were reversed for a short time during the reign of his half-sister Mary. Queen Mary became the next in the line of succession from 1553, while Edward had named his cousin Lady Jane Grey as heir, she was only queen for nine days, but the government deposed her. It is under Queen Mary, remembered in history as Bloody Mary, that Edward's reforms were reversed. And for a short time, Roman Catholic practices continued. Once assuming control, she hailed to the nation that her subjects did not have to follow the Protestant mandates legislated by Edward. And in a broker deal with Pope Julius III, Mary obtained the authority to execute Protestants under the Heresy Acts. About a thousand notable Protestants lived in exile in Europe during her reign. Others suffered under the new order. Wealthy loyalists to her half-brother were executed while the Archbishop of Canterbury was imprisoned. High-ranking bishops were burned at the stake for heresy as well. Hundreds more were executed in a similar fashion. Married to the future Spanish king, Mary died at 42 from the flu. While the Spanish government would later be unsuccessful in unseating Elizabeth with the Scottish Catholic Mary Stuart, also known as Mary Queen of Scots, by the 1580s, history remembers this Mary as Bloody Mary, sister of Elizabeth and surviving daughter of Catherine of Aragon. Following in her father's footsteps would be the accomplishments and reign of Queen Elizabeth. Under her leadership, England expanded her naval force, reinstated Edward's Protestant reforms along with others, and supported colonial exploration for reasons of trade and settlement. Known as the Elizabethan era, the reign of this monarch would see the rise of religious tolerance. While Queen Elizabeth maintained caution regarding foreign affairs, it would be during her later years England would witness popularity of well-written and produced theatric plays by William Shakespeare and Marlowe. Ruling England across four decades, Elizabeth would survive plots against her rule created conditions allowing for economic prosperity and helped to establish patterns that fostered loyalty to the crown and its government by the people. This brings us to an end to another lecture reading. Thank you. Mm -hmm.